Two women will be going about their household tasks. One will be taken, the other left. So be prepared, for you don't know what day your Lord is coming. Life was filled with guns and war, and everyone got trampled on the floor. I wish we'd all been ready. Children died, the days grew cold, a piece of bread could buy a bag of I wish we'd all been ready. There's no time to change your mind. The sun has come. You've been left behind. A man and wife are sleeping there. Standing still, I wish we all were ready. There's no time to change your mind. The sun has come. Seven, we're hearing about Solomon's bed, and around that bed we've got valiant men. So we've got hosts. These are host words. These are celestial mighty fighters, the valiant of Israel. Because it seems to me that when Solomon chased after these strange women and worshipped their gods, it's looking like to me that worshipping strange gods is in fact host worship. So he's got valiant men about him. He's got hosts around him fighting his wars and they all hold swords being expert in war. Every man hath his sword upon his thigh because of fear, because of fear in the night. So Solomon made himself a chariot, a celestial chariot of the wood of Lebanon, this being the wood that Haram, king of Tyre, the anointed chair of the covereth, gave him. And he made the pillars thereof with silver, the bottom thereof of gold, the covering of purple, the midst thereof being paved with love for the daughters of Jerusalem. So is this a good love? Or is this a having 700 wives and 300 concubines? Love. Go forth, ye daughters of Zion, now. Have the daughters of Zion been behaving themselves? Isaiah 3.16 Moreover, the Lord saith, Because the daughters of Zion are haughty, and walk with stretched forth necks and wanton eyes, walking and mincing as they go, and making a tinkling with their feet. Therefore, the Lord will smite with a scab the crown of the head of the daughters of Zion, and the Lord will discover their secret parts. When the Lord shall have washed away the filth, the filth of the daughters of Zion, and shall have purged the blood of Jerusalem from the midst thereof by the spirit of judgment and by the spirit of burning. Go ye forth, O ye daughters of Zion, and behold King Solomon. So we know at some point that King Solomon turned. He went from having all the wisdom in the world to loving many strange women. And in Isaiah 3, 16, 17 and 4, 4, we're reading that the daughters of Zion are covered with filth. The Lord is going to smite them with a scab and discover their secret parts due to their abhorrent behavior. And they are haughty, whoring, right? They seem to be whoredom women. Go ye forth, O ye daughters of Zion, and behold King Solomon with the crown, wherewith his mother 
crown him in the day of his espousals, in the day of his weddings, and in the day of the gladness of his heart. And we know that Solomon loved many strange women and he had 700 wives and 300 concubines. So were all of his wives strange? Was all of his concubines strange? Is it possible that the daughters of Zion perhaps were strange women? What makes these women strange? But we know Solomon, he had a thousand wives and concubines combined. And we've got, Go forth, O ye daughters of Zion, who are haughty, covered in filth, and the Lord is going to smite them with a scab and discover their secret parts due to their whoredom. Go ye forth, and behold King Solomon with the crown, where is his mother have crowned him in the day of his, his espousals. So for me, we've potentially got a connection with Solomon and all of his weddings. Are these good weddings or are these weddings he's like he's, he would have had 700 of them? He's had 700 espousals. He's had 700 weddings in his time, Solomon. And we've got the daughters of Zion being told to go forth and behold him with that crown that his mother crowned him with in the day of those weddings. And those daughters of Zion are covered in filth and scabs and they're haughty women. And we know that Solomon loved many strange women. I just can't help to think that all these things are connected, eh? So Solomon had a vineyard at Baal-Haman. And Baal-Haman, it means Lord. And we've got Baal, it means Lord. But Baal-Haman, it's, it's connected to host worship. It's connected to Jupiter. It's connected to host worship. And it's sacred to Ammon. Sacred to Jupiter, Ammon. So this is leading me to think that Baal-Haman, Jupiter, is the god that the children of Ammon was worshipping. Now in 1 Kings 11, we seem to have two different gods for Ammon. We've got Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. And in verse 7, we've got Molech, the abomination of the children of Ammon. Now whether there's a difference here between the children of Ammon, Ammon means tribal and the Ammonites, and I've had a look at Ammonite as well, and Ammonite is just a descendant of Ammon, still meaning tribal. So we've got Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites, and we've got Molech, the abomination of the children of Ammon. We've got two different two different gods that they were that they were worshipping here. And we've got Baal-Haman, this being the site of Solomon's vineyard, and the Chaldee lexicon is giving us a place of multitude sacred to Jupiter, Ammon. So the Chaldee lexicon here is absolutely leading me to think that this vineyard that Solomon planted was planted to the children of Ammon and potentially to one of these gods. I don't know if the children of Ammon had any more gods than this, but we've got Milcom and we've got Molech. So it seems that this vineyard was planted for the god of the children of Ammon, those gods being Milcom and Molech. Now check this out for just like a total plot twist, right? So Milcom means great king. We've got Molech. Molech means king. So the two gods of the children of Ammon are Milcom, and one means great king. And we've got the other god, Molech, it means it means king. Now, a really well-known scripture is Amos 5.26. But ye have borne the tabernacle of your Molech and chewing your images, the star of your God, which ye made to yourself. So this word Moloch, it's an interesting word because each time we read the word king, it's, it's the same Hebrew word as what we read here for this word Moloch. So we only read it as Moloch once, but we read it as king, right? We read it as king 2,518 times. So this word Moloch is king. So it means it means king. So the second translation of the word Moloch means king. We've got Molech that we read about in 1 Kings 11 and all of these other scriptures. I'm going to get to in a sec, including Leviticus 18. It means, it means king. And we've got Milcom. Milcom means great king. And in the New Testament, we read about Moloch once in Acts 7.43. Ye, you took up the tabernacle of Moloch and to the star of your God, Ramphan, figures that you made to worship them and I will carry you away beyond Babylon. 
So this is the blue star, of course. This is the blue star that they all worship today, the God of the giants, the God of the artificial creation. And I'm being absolutely led to think that that's why they worship this star, because that's exactly who they are. These creatures running the world today are, in fact, giants. But we see this word, Moloch, we get it once in the New Testament. And again, it means king, and it's giving us the name of the idol god of the Ammonites. So I'm being absolutely led to think that both of these gods that we read about in 1 Kings 11 for Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites, and Molech, the abomination of the children of Ammon, I'm being absolutely led to think that both of these pertain, both of these pertain to Molech. But for Balhaman, the site of Solomon's vineyard, it gives us sacred to Jupiter, right? It gives us sacred to Jupiter Ammon. And where we read the word Molech, that we're reading about in 1 Kings 11.7, we can see here in the Chaldee lexicon that it gives, us, it gives us Saturn. So it seems to be pertaining to Saturn worship. It's giving us the Ammonites. So it's the god of the Ammonites, and it's about Saturn, is Molech in 1 Kings 11. But the site of Solomon's vineyard, Balhaman, it's giving us Ammon Jupiter. So whether there's a difference here that the vineyard that Solomon planted was sacred to Jupiter and being of the children of Ammon to Molech, and I'm being led to think Milcom is all about Saturn, I'm not sure. But this is host worship. This is a manifestation and a demonstration of these strange wives leading Solomon to worship the host of heaven. And just on this background noise, it is a very wintry, rainy day here on the New South Wales Central Coast. So please forgive the background noise. You can see how I'm attired. It is absolutely freezing cold. So please, please think of me here in my, in my humble little abode, in my humble little abode without heating. I've been waiting to put these parts of this video down, but it just won't stop raining. So if the background noise is a little loud, Please forgive me, that is, that's the reason for it. But here we've got Solomon. This is a manifestation to me now because we've got Molech. Molech means Saturn. That seems to me to be fairly well settled here in 1 Kings 11.7 that Molech is Saturn. So this is a manifestation of King Solomon He's worshipping the heavenly host. In Jeremiah 48, we read something that I noticed during my last read of the scriptures that changed, just changed for me the way the scriptures are coming across. And in verse 7, For because thou hast trusted in thy works and in thy treasures, thou shalt also be taken. And Chemosh, right? Chemosh, shall go forth into captivity with his with his priests and his princes together. Now, this Chemosh is one of these strange gods that King Solomon was worshipping in 1 Kings 11, 7. Chemosh is the abomination of Moab. Now, Chemosh means subduer, the national deity of the Moabites and a god of the Ammonites. It's interesting. Also a god of the Ammonites. It seems Ammonites may have three. Also identified with Baalpua, Baalzebub, Mars, Mars, right, and Saturn. So we've got what they call planets here. We've got two of them. We've got Mars and Saturn. I just wonder whether that might go to a way to explain why Solomon's Vineyard's all about Jupiter, and it means king, and Molech means king, and Molech pertains to Saturn, I wonder, because we've got two here. We've got two of these celestial bodies that they call planets, Mars and Saturn, being attached to Chemosh. But in Jeremiah 43.7, we've got Chemosh being referred to as a he. As a he. So Chemosh is a he. So that's leading me to think that these celestial bodies, such as Chemosh, Mars, Saturn, celestial bodies, heavenly hosts, things that we can see in the sky, this is leading me to think that these things have breath, have life, with his priests and his princesses together. It's, it's He's being referred to as a he. So if it wasn't 
ha alive, if it didn't have breath, it would just be an it, I would have thought. But because it's a he, that tells me that these celestial bodies, Chamosh, Mars and Saturn, have breath. And in 1 Kings 11, 7, we've got Solomon. He's building a high place for them. He's worshipping these celestial bodies. These strange gods, Chamosh, Saturn, Mars, Molech, Saturn. These are heavenly hosts. These are celestial bodies that Solomon is worshipping. Solomon is worshipping the heavenly host in those scriptures. And in Deuteronomy 4 and 17, we've got Moses commanding the children of Israel not to do these things. And lest thou lift up thine eyes into heaven, and when thou seest the sun and the moon and the stars, even all. Now, whenever I read this, this is leading me to think that what's happened before the even all is what is happening after it. So we're talking about the host of heaven are the sun, moon and the stars and that makes sense with the meaning of the word host. The meaning of the word host uh, is of the sun, moon and stars. It's the celestial body. It's the celestial it's the celestial host. Sun, moon, and the stars, even all the host of heaven. Should thou be driven to worship them? So we're talking about worshipping the sun, the moon, and the stars, these celestial bodies. And serve them which the Lord thy God hath divided unto all nations under the whole heaven. So this is fascinating to me. Because this is telling me that the Lord God has given unto whatever a nation is, whatever a nation is, I, I was reminded this morning of the of the the chapter of the scriptures in the New Testament where the Lord Jesus Christ says he's going to divide all nations, the sheep and goats. So does that mean every nation are sheep and every nation are goat? Or are we talking about individual people? Or are we talking about both? But this is telling me that the Lord God has divided. So that he's given. He's given the hosts of heaven. He's divided them up. He's divided them up between everyone. They have some sort of power. That's why they're worshipping them. They have some sort of power. Which the Lord thy God hath divided unto all nations under the whole heaven. Don't worship these things. So this is what Solomon was doing. And in chapter 17, And hath gone and served other gods and worshipped them. So we've got the children of Israel serving other gods and worshipping them other gods. What are those gods? Well, those gods are the sun the moon, or any of the hosts of heaven, which I have not commanded. So in 1 Kings 11, we're seeing a manifestation of this. Solomon is doing that. All of these, Chemosh, Molech, Milcom, Ashtaroth, they're all a heavenly host. It seems to me now, I think what I'm learning here now, is that all of these strange gods that the Lord gives a name to is a celestial body as I think of that scripture in Psalms where the Lord has named every single celestial body. Isaiah thirteen ten, we read that the moon is a she. We read it again in Ezekiel 32, 7, the moon shall not give her light. And the Lord Jesus Christ says it in Matthew 24, the moon shall not give her light. So we've got the moon being referred to as a she. And again, that just leads me to think that because the moon's being referred to as a she by the Lord Jesus Christ, that the moon is a living celestial host. It has life. It just gives a whole new level to the globe earth like this because the globe earth lie insists on everything outside of earth being a dead void space of no life, but it seems to me, as I go on and on, the waters above are a thriving, thriving life where there's much war, there's much war going on. Judges 5.31, so let all thine enemies perish, O Lord, let them that love him be as the sun when he, when he goeth forth in his 
Mites. And we've got the sun being referred to as a he. We've got the Lord Jesus Christ referring to the moon as a she. And we've got Chamosh being referred to as a he. And Chamosh has his princes and his priests. So this living celestial body, Chamosh, has his own priests and his own princes. And the outline of biblical usage is giving us Mars and Saturn. Living, breathing, celestial bodies that through the mouth of Moses, the Lord God commanded the children of Israel not to serve. These celestial bodies that have life, Chemosh being one of them. It seems to me here, this is an example. Chemosh is just another name for what they call Saturn. It's probably the real name. They call it Saturn today. They call it Mars today. But the real name for these celestial heavenly bodies is Chemosh and Molech. And that's what we're talking about here. They're not called Saturn. They're not called Mars. They're in fact called Chemosh and Molech. Now this starts to give a whole heap of new context to some scriptures that I've shared previously that have been coming into me hard for a long time. Isaiah 24, 21. And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall punish the host of the high ones that are on high. So these heavenly hosts, these celestial bodies that we can see, including Chemosh and Molech, that they call Mars, Saturn and Jupiter, have life and they are sinning. They have life, they have breath and they are sinning. And the kings of the earth upon the earth. And they shall be gathered together as prisoners are gathered together in the pit. This is just reminding me now of Ezekiel 31 and, and, and the book of Jude and the wandering stars and the men of Korah. And shall be shut up in the prison. So the prison seemingly is the pit. And after many days they shall be visited. Then the moon shall be confounded and the sun ashamed. When the Lord of hosts shall reign in Mount Zion. Look at that. Ooh, look at that. Mount Zion and in Jerusalem and before her ancient glory. So Mount Zion is separated from the plain of Rephaim by the valley of the son of Hinnom. And the valley of the son of Hinnom is where they pass their children through the fire to and they did that to Molech, and that's what Solomon was doing when he worshipped this heavenly host. I'm just at fever pitch that Solomon was making giants. But we've got the moon and the sun. Well, they're going to show emotion, aren't they? They're going to show emotion because they're part of the heavenly host because the Lord's going to punish. The Lord's going to punish the host of the high ones that are on high. The moon, she, the sun, he are going to be confounded and they are going to be ashamed because they have life, they have breath, they are living celestial bodies. And Genesis 37, 9 and 10, some scriptures I have shared numerous times on this channel. Very, very big scriptures in this house. And he dreamed yet another dream. This is Joseph. And told his brethren and said, I have dreamed a dream more and the sun and the moon and the 11 stars made obstinance to him. And he told his father and to his brethren and his father rebuked him and said unto him, What is this dream that thou hast dreamed? Shall I, I, thy mother and thy brethren indeed come to bow down ourselves to thee, to the earth? So Jacob is telling us, as he says to Joseph, these things, that he is the son, that his mother Rachel is the moon, and thy brethren, the eleven stars, are the eleven brothers of Joseph. Joseph being the twelfth star that we read about in Revelation 12. And in Genesis 43, we see a manifestation, a fulfillment of Joseph's dream. And when Joseph came home, they bought him. So this is the 11 brothers. They bought him the present which was in their hand to the house. 
and bowed themselves to him to the earth and asked them of their welfare and said, Is your father well? The old man of whom you speak, is he yet alive? And they answered, Thy servant our father is in good health. He is yet alive. And they bowed down their heads and made obstinance. I haven't seen a scripture where we see Jacob or Rachel do this because Rachel's dead by now. But we've, we've got a manifestation here of the 11 brothers, the 11 stars coming down to the earth and bowing and making obstinance to Joseph. So it seems to me that Jacob being the sun, Rachel the moon and the 12 brothers, the 11 stars and those celestial bodies having breath is it's all connected it's absolutely all connected to the 12 tribes of israel and them being as the promise to isaac being as the stars of heaven so moses is telling the children of israel in deuteronomy 4 and 17 not to do these things not to worship these celestial bodies these other gods that it seems to me now have life and Solomon did these things Solomon was led to do these things by all of these strange wives these strange wives turned his heart away from the Lord God of Israel and in Song of Solomon 3 we're hearing about Solomon's espousals we're hearing about Solomon's espousals when his mother crowned him and we're hearing about the daughters of Zion beholding King Solomon with the crown where his mother crowned him in the day of all his weddings and those daughters of Zion well it seems those daughters of Zion have been up to no good at all because of the daughters of Zion are haughty the Lord will smite with a scab the crown of the head of the daughters of Zion and the Lord will discover their secret parts and wash away the filth of the daughters of Zion. So it seems to me that the daughters of Zion haven't been up to good. And we've got the daughters of Zion beholding King Solomon with the crown that his mother gave him in the day of all of his weddings. And he had 700 of these weddings and these were weddings to strange wives. And these wives turned away his heart and made him sacrifice and worship these strange gods seemingly the host of heaven these celestial bodies that we can see today with our eyes these women caused him to do these things so i don't know who is my beloved who is my love how does solomon get mixed up in all of this and is my beloved actually lucifer because we've got connections with the beryl and the sapphire my beloved being described as highly sought after and beautiful and that's how lucifer was being was being described as well and we've got the connections to the cedars of lebanon and we're talking about solomon's bed i don't know i don't know how all this is connected but i just know in my heart there's connections here and we've got solomon solomon is going after these strange women and these strange women caused him to not go after the Lord God of Israel, instead going after these celestial bodies, these gods of heaven, these celestial hosts, these hosts that it would appear have life. Now one of these gods that Solomon hoard after in 1 Kings 11 and verse 5 was Milcom. Milcom being the abomination of, of the Ammonites. And Milcom means great king. And we read that the Israelites sacrificed their infants in the in the valley of him. So they're, they're sending their seed through the fire to Molech here. This is a manifestation of Leviticus 18. They're sending their children through the fire in the valley of Hinnom. Whether this is the valley of the son of Hinnom, I'm not sure. But I'm absolutely being led to think that when they did this, when they, when they sacrificed their their sons and their daughters and they sent their seed through the fire to Molech in the valley of the son of Hinnom. They were in fact making giants. And check this out. Check this out. A Benjamite. So here we go again. Here we go again. We've got Molech being in the lineage of Benjamin. We've got it again. We've got Molech, Saturn, being in the lineage of Benjamin and Saturn is the god of the blue star. That's what Amos 5.26 is talking about. And that's what it's talking about in Acts 7 as well. That blue star 
that they worship today because I'm being led to think they are giants. But that blue star is the star of Saturn. It's the star of Moloch. It's the star of Satan. And we've got Moloch again. And I just read this in Jeremiah 51 that I feel has just given me a pretty significant confirmation that I'm in truth here, just about these strange gods having breath. And the Holy Spirit is in fact telling me to continue on on this path. It's quite exciting this, but it's also getting... I think you'll see in the next little part of this video that it's getting it's getting quite bizarre. It's it's getting it, it's uh, the truth was always going to seem strange, and just what I'm finding in these lineages now it's it's it, it's bizarre. It just looks bizarre, and the truth that we've been lied to about everything, haven't we? And the truth was always going to seem strange. It was always going to seem bizarre, and because the diary. I am currently up to Ezekiel 9. Ezekiel 9. Now, Jeremiah this time was very, very interesting indeed. I just saw the celestial more and more. And I really, I really pray and I trust in the next, probably the next read of the Old Testament, I'm going to be able to articulate this stuff a little bit better. But I just... It's one of those situations where, yes, if you're sitting here, I'd be able to convey it to you. But to be able to, it's just so difficult. But I, I'm seeing it more and more and lamentations just flowed into it. Lamentations just flowed from Jeremiah this time, rolling into Lamentations 4, sorry, Lamentations 2, where where we hear about Israel being cast down from heaven. It just It just rolled into it this time and... I, I hope to be able to articulate this a little bit better as I as I go on. And yes, it's stopped raining. I can actually see some blue sky out there, but I think it's coming back. So forgive me if the background noise does occur again. It's the next day now. It's it's now it's it's now tomorrow. But I think we're going to get it again. But it's a lot warmer now. It's a lot warmer. It was so so cold before. Well, yesterday when I put down that part of that video, it, man, man, it was cold. Now, Jeremiah 51, these are some scriptures that I've I've shared on this channel before where it just, it seems to me that we've got a manifestation of of the Godhead and this this daughter of Zion and Zion, just before I go on, it feel it's feeling as though to me that everybody has a daughter. I've read, I think it's, Moab and Esau, and I'll put them up on the screen now where I've seen it, but it just seems that every nation has a daughter and that daughter, their condition is as a result of that nation's works. So for instance, with Israel, so if Israel is sinning, which they did, that means the daughter of Zion was in a, was in a really, it was, she was in a bad state. And it seems that we read scripture to say that she was actually sinning. So whether the daughter of Zion is a is a symbolic being or not, I'm 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 not sure at the moment. But I I see that that they all all of these nations seem to have a daughter. But I'm really so much at the moment. I, I feel as though this video could go off into a hundred different directions at the moment, and it is my intent on this part of this video just to get back to Saul and the the lineages and how I'm potentially seeing there seems to be some sort of relationship between the groves and Baal and that seems to be it's looking like to me there's some sort of relationship going on. I just want to say it's getting so strange. It looks like there's some sort of relationship going on with what they call Venus and Saturn, but it appears that Venus is actually Ashtaroth and Saturn is actually Baal and and Molech, and, and they're having some sort of relationship, and we see it right through the scriptures. And I, I'm going to, <laughs> I'm going to talk. Firstly, it is my intent just to get back to just these things that I'm seeing in the lineage of the soil. It's just. It's quite strange. It's 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 bizarre. You'll, I'll, I'll I'll get to it in just a minute. But in Jeremiah fifty one, this is where we I feel as though we're getting a manifestation of the Godhead speaking to one another. 
In verse 33, for thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, the daughter. So this is the Lord of the celestial bodies, of which of which you've got Ashtaroth and Malek and Baal and all of these bodies they today call planets and all of these constellations we see when we look up into the sky. And also angels, that actual Hebrew word, H6635, it talks about, it talks to angels as well. Sun, moon, stars, and, and angels. So that, that, that's who the Lord of hosts is. So that we're getting a manifestation here of the Lord of the celestial bodies. He's talking to the Lord. And as I go on and on, the Lord is the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord God is the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Lord of hosts is the Spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ and the Lord Jesus Christ in the flesh is the Lord Jesus Christ. I feel Zechariah 13, 7 tells us that. But in verse 33, For thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, the daughter of Babylon. See, here it is. Here it is here. The daughter of Babylon is like a threshing floor. It is time to thresh her yet a little while and the time of the harvest shall come. So the daughter of Babylon is as a consequence of what's been happening with Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, hath devoured me. He hath crushed me. So this is a Lord of hosts talking. He hath made me an empty vessel. He hath swallowed me up like a dragon. He hath filled his belly with my delicates and hath cast me out. The violence done to me and to my flesh be upon Babylon, shall the inhabitants of Zion say. So the Lord of hosts is telling us that the inhabitants of Zion is going to say that the violence done to them and their flesh is going to be upon Babylon. And the inhabitants of Jerusalem are going to say that their blood is upon the inhabitants of, of Chaldea. Shall Jerusalem say, right? So as a result of these things, therefore thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will plead Thy cause. So we've got the Lord of hosts lamenting the condition of Israel due to what Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, has done to Zion and Jerusalem, them being Babylon and, and, and Chaldea. Therefore, so as a result of these things, says the Lord to the Lord of hosts, Behold, I, the Lord, will plead thy cause, the Lord of hosts. So who's he pleading his cause to, right? And take vengeance for thee. I will dry up her sea and make her springs dry and Babylon shall become heaps. So this is leading me to think that you've got the Lord of hosts, the Lord of the celestial bodies, pleading his cause to the Lord who's going to go then and plead his cause with someone else. So it looks like there's another manifestation of a Godhead that we're not seeing here. And I just wonder whether that's the Almighty, because I read the word. And it's just one God. I want to put it out there. I absolutely want to put it out there that there's only one God. But there is a scripture. I'll put it up on screen. I think it's in Zephaniah, where it says, In that glorious day, the Lord shall be known as one name. But we've got the Lord. He's manifesting in different ways. And he's got different names. But I just want to put it out there that the Lord is only one. There's only one Lord. There's not. I'm not talking that there's, there's many different Lords going on here. But it seems here that we've got a manifestation of, of the Godhead going on. And it seems there's another manifestation of it we're not seeing. Because the Lord is going to plead the cause of the Lord of hosts. So who's he going to plead it to? And take vengeance for her, for thee, and I will dry up her sea. So this is leading me to think that the Lord is going to dry up the sea of the daughter of Babylon. Because the daughter of Babylon is a result of this. So Nebuchadnezzar and the Chaldeans and the Babylonians, they've been doing these things. So as a result of this, the Lord is going to dry up her sea and make her springs dry, the daughter of Babylon, right? But this scripture here, now this has caught my attention a few times as I've read through the scriptures, just this bell, right? And this is where I feel as I'm getting this, just this confirmation that I'm in truth here. And I will punish Bel in Babylon. 
Now, you read that without knowing who Bell is. So do you know who Bell is? Just just off the, just a, just a question, right? Do you know who Bell is? So I read that and I think, well, okay, Bell is actually a living entity because Bell is going to get, Bell is going to get punished. And that scripture I've been sharing about Chamosh too in Jeremiah, it says the same thing. I'll pop it up on screen, but it's 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 saying that there's going to be a consequence to Chamosh. So Chamosh has got life, right? I will punish Bel in Babylon and I will bring forth out of his mouth, right? So this Bel is going to be punished and is a he. So Bel is a living entity, right? So who's Bel? Hebrew word 1078. Bell and Bell means Lord. Here we go. Bell means Lord, a chief Babylonian deity. Just this word deity. But Bell means Lord. We've heard that before. We've got Baal. Baal means Lord. And I'm going to get back to this in a bit. But we first read about Baal in Judges 2 11 and 13. And this is what I'm talking about, how there seems to be this relationship going on with Baal and Ashtaroth, Saturn, maybe Jupiter and Venus. That's what I'm starting to see going on here. But we've got Baal means Lord. We've got Bel means Lord. And we've got Baal Haman, the site of Solomon's vineyard. It means Lord, Lord possessor of abundance. And this vineyard of Solomon's, it's connected with, with Jupiter, Jupiter and, and Ammon. Now, the word Baal, H1168, that we first read about in Judges 2 that I just shared, it also means Lord. There doesn't seem to be any information here about what celestial body it represents, but it's a deity. It's a deity. We see this word deity again. This word deity is very interesting indeed. Bel means Lord. This is the scripture I'm sharing in Jeremiah 51. Bel means Lord, a chief Babylonian deity. Now, this word deity doesn't appear in the scriptures. So I thought I'd have a look at the world to see what the world says what a deity is. And Google says that a deity is a god or a goddess. A celestial body, right? That's where I'm being led right now, that all of these gods and goddesses, they're all celestial bodies. And we come back to Baal, and we see that Baal is a deity. And we've got Baal Haman, the site of Solomon's vineyard, is connected to Jupiter, Jupiter being a deity. And we've got Bel, Bel meaning Lord as well, is a chief Babylonian deity. Deity. And yes, it's just started raining uh, again. I thought it was going to happen again. Now, the Chaldee lexicon is very interesting for this word, for this word, Bell. So we read the word Bell three times in the scriptures. Bell, Bell, down, Nebo, Stupeth. I'm going to get to a couple of these words in just a sec because it's very, very interesting indeed. But the Chaldee lexicon, domestic and chief god of the Babylonians. So Bel is a deity. It's a god. It's a celestial. It's a celestial body, and the Lord is going to punish. The Lord is going to punish Bel in ba Babylon. So Bel's in in Babylon, and Bel is a he. So the Lord's going to punish this deity, this god, this celestial body that has life. And he's going to do that in Babylon. So this this is what I say before, how I'm just starting to see, how I'm just starting to see the celestial more and more in the scriptures, particularly in Jeremiah, because the Lord's going to do this to this celestial body, to this God, to this deity. Well, he's going to do that in Babylon, isn't he? But a chief God of the Babylonians worshipped in the Tower of Babel. I, I read that. I thought, okie dokie. So we're right back now to Nimrod. We're right back now to the Tower of Babel because that's what Babylon is. Babel, Babylon, it's all it's all confusion by mixing. So it seems this bell, which means Lord, is a chief Babylonian deity. Well, they were worshipping this, this God, this deity, this celestial body, going all the way back, going all the way back to the Tower of Babel time. But... We get, we get a connection here again with Jupiter. We get a connection here with Jupiter. So I'm starting to see a bit of a theme here. 
that when we see the word Lord, that Lord is connected is connected with Jupiter because we see it in Solomon's vineyard. So Baal Haman, again meaning Lord, it's connected. It's connected to Jupiter. So Lord, I've seen it twice now. I've seen Lord seems to mean Jupiter, and it seems that King, which we see here as Molech for Hebrew word H four four three two. Whenever we see king, that seems to be associated with Saturn. We see it in the Chaldee lexicon here. So it seems that the, the king and Molech, that's Saturn. But when we see Lord, that's Jupiter. We also see it with Milcom. Milcom means great king. And it also gives us also Molech. It doesn't talk about what celestial body with Milcom, but it says also Molech, and Molech means king, and Molech is Saturn. So I'm not quite sure what this means with Solomon in his vineyard, and what's a vineyard, right? What does a vineyard actually represent? But Solomon's vineyard, so we've got Solomon's vineyard is Baal Haman, which is Lord, and Jupiter. We've got, we've got Lord and Jupiter, but it's also connected, it's also connected to Ammon, and as I see it, we see two of them in 1 Kings 11. We've got Milcom and we've got Molech. And Molech is king and that's Saturn. And Milcom, it means great king and Molech, also Saturn. So both of the gods, the celestial bodies that's attributed to Ammon that Solomon's whoring after in 1 Kings 11 are attributed to Saturn. And we've also got Chemosh. Chemosh means subduer, a, a god of the Ammonites. So that's a third, but it's attributed with Mars and Saturn. But Chemosh, of course, is a national deity. So we've got this word deity, which means a celestial body. It's a god, it's a, a celestial body that has life. And that's what we read in the scripture that I've been sharing in Jeremiah 48. For because thou hast trusted in thy works and in thy treasures, thou shalt also be taken and Chemosh shall go forth into captivity. So there's a consequence for Chemosh, this deity, this God, that they're worshipping, this celestial body that they're worshipping, Chemosh, he shall go forth into captivity with his priests and with his with his princesses together. So Chemosh is a deity that has life and it's attributed to the Ammonites again with Saturn, Saturn and Mars. So what I can see is the Ammonites have got three gods and all three of those are attributed to Saturn and one of them here, Chemosh, is also attributed to Mars, but I'm not seeing anything that gives us that connection of Baal Haman. Baal Haman meaning Lord of the Ammonites and Jupiter. I'm not seeing any connection with the Ammonites worshipping Jupiter. I'm only seeing three gods attributed to, to Saturn and also one of those attributed to Mars. So back in Hebrew word H1078 for Bel, the scripture that we, we read in Jeremiah 51, and I will punish Bel. I will punish Bel. This deity, this God, this celestial body that has breath, I will punish Bel in Babylon. So the Lord's going to do this thing in Babylon and I will bring forth out of his mouth that he has swallowed up. So we've got a we've got a living body, a living celestial body here doing physical things. And I, I'm just at fever pitch that that these heavenly celestial bodies actually take on a, a physical form as well. And that story about a mesa, a mesa wallowing in blood, that's led me to think there's there's both blood and flesh in the in the heavenly realm as well. But the Chaldee lexicon, it gives us it gives us Jupiter, and it mentions Jupiter again, which all rested on the worship of the stars. So that's what's going on here. They're worshiping celestial bodies. Why are they doing it? Why are they worshiping celestial bodies? They've got to be giving them some sort of benefit and these celestial bodies in order for them to be doing this thing would have to have had more power than them so they're looking up to them they're looking for something more than what they've got currently from these celestial bodies 
they're giving them power and they're held in higher regard to them. Otherwise, they wouldn't be worshipping these things. So for me, they're worship, there's two things happening here. The fact that they're worshipping them tells us is that they hold these celestial bodies up to higher regard than themselves and they're doing it because these celestial bodies give them power, give them an advantage that they wouldn't otherwise normally have. But check this out. The Shemitic nations worship supremely as a good demon. A demon. And the author and guardian of all fortune, it is therefore called the Arabians' greater fortune. And then we get a connection to Venus. Venus was worshipped with this planet. So this is Jupiter. This is Jupiter, and that's what Solomon's vineyard was. Solomon's vineyard was dedicated to worshipping Jupiter, and that's what this bell is. And bell is the deity they've been worshipping since the Tower of Babel days. But these scriptures get very, very interesting indeed. Bell boweth down, Nebo stoopeth. Their idols were upon the beasts and upon the cattle. Your carriages were heavy laden. They are a burden to the weary beast. And this is what I'm saying. I read that and instantly I think that's celestial. All of what we're reading here is celestial. The beasts, the cattle, the carriages, they're all the weary beasts. We're talking about celestial bodies here now that word nebo it means prophet and nebo is a babylonian deity all right so we've got this word deity again and it doesn't appear in scriptures but the the, the definition the english definition of the word deity is a god and i'm being absolutely led to think now because these things have life these celestial bodies that they're all worshiping a deity, a god, if you see a god, something that's a god, a god's a deity and a god is a celestial body. So a deity, so this Nebo, this Nebo is a celestial body. Bell boweth down, Bell seems to be Jupiter, Nebo stoopeth. So we've got two celestial bodies here. And the outline of biblical usage and in the Chaldee lexicon for Nebo seems to be pointing us towards Mercury, and Mercury as well, is a celestial body that they call that they call a wandering star. That's this Nebo. And it's got a few different meanings. It's a city in Moab. It's a city in Judah. And look at this. It's the mountain where Moses died. So this is actually a celestial body. This is, and that's what it's saying. That's what it's saying. It's saying that Nebo is a Babylonian deity and it's giving us it's giving us Latin Mercury and we see the word Mercury in the Chaldee lexicon. So if this is indeed a celestial body, well, it's also saying it's a city in Moab, isn't it? And it's saying it's a city in Judah. This celestial body, this Nebo, is a city. A celestial body is a city in Moab and in Judah and a celestial body is where the mountain where Moses died is located. So it's very, very interesting. And that's what I was saying at the start of this part of this video. Is It's getting bizarre. It's getting really, really strange here. And I just have to, I have to continue to, I'm just going to keep going. I'm going to keep going and I'm not going to let man scare me, fear me out of seeking the truth. Because it was always going to seem strange. And I don't want it to be strange. I just want to know what it is, the truth. I just want it. And it's just getting bizarre. It just looks absolutely bizarre what's going on at the moment. But we're going to plow on and just let the scriptures and the study tools that I've got, just let them and the Holy Spirit guide me. It's, it's, it's hard to get my head around at the moment, but we will plow on. Worshipped as the celestial scribe by the Chaldeans. It seems to me that these Chaldeans are stargazers. They're stargazers. They're, they're, they're host worshippers. And that's where, that's where Abraham came from. 
Abraham came from there. So in Joshua 24, where Joshua tells the children of Israel that they took their father Abraham from the other side of the flood, that word flood seems to indicate the river Euphrates. The river Euphrates seems to separate, separate the Chaldeans from Canaan. And right through Ezra and Nehemiah, they talk about the river as well. I just wonder whether it's the same river. I'm, I'm not sure, but the Chaldeans seem to be host worshippers and they seem to be dwelling among those hosts because it says that the Lord's going to punish Bel in Babylon. And then we start to get just some more explanations about its location the mountain on the border of Moab and a town in the tribe of Judah and these scriptures in Nehemiah and Ezra. So Nehemiah 7, that's the scriptures that I shared on this channel previously, on previous videos, where it's addressed to H582 men and H582 men are also known as angels. I've done videos on Nehemiah where I'm being led to think that Nehemiah is set in heaven and I just, I feel as though with everything I learned, I'm getting just more and more confirmations at the moment and the Holy Spirit just wants me to keep going and that's why I've seen this. That's why I've seen this scripture about Bell and the Lord's going to punish Bell because Bell, Bell has life. Bell is a celestial body that's been sinning, that's been getting worshipped and the Lord's going to punish this, this living celestial body. But we see Nebo right through, right through the scriptures. And we see Moses went up from the plains of Moab unto the mountain of Nebo. Is this Mercury? Is this the celestial body of, of Mercury? Is that what's happening here? Is Moses going up from the plains of Moab to a celestial body? Is that what's happening here? And that's what I say. That's what I say. I'm just going to keep being brave and keep going where the scriptures leave me. And Moses tells us in Deuteronomy 32 that he's talking to the heavens. And Isaiah says it too in Isaiah 1 too. He says the same thing. So that's leading me to think the whole book of Isaiah is addressed to the heavens and the earth. But Moses here, I'm absolutely being led to think that Moses, he can talk to the heaven and he's expecting the heavens to be able to hear him. And in Deuteronomy 30, he's talking to the children of Israel about what will happen if they sin. He's talking to these heavenly bodies. And if any of thine be driven out to the utmost parts of the heaven, from thence will the Lord gather thee, and from thence will he fetch thee. So he's talking to heavenly celestial bodies, is Moses. So I think it's entirely possible that he is going up to a celestial body called Mercury. To me, it seems quite logical at this point. And the Lord thy God will bring thee into the land which thy fathers possessed. And in the celestial book of Nehemiah, we see the Lord God using Nehemiah to perform that very prophecy. And in verse 9, we've got Nehemiah, he's, he's praying to the Lord and he's quoting Moses. Remember, I beseech thee the word that commandest thy servant Moses, saying, But if you turn unto me and keep my commandments and do them, though they were of you cast out, unto the utmost part of the heaven. Yet I will gather them from thence and will bring them unto the place that I have chosen to set my name there. Now these are thy servants and thy people. So Nehemiah is presenting these people that Moses was talking about, these celestial bodies, before the Lord. The entire book of Nehemiah about him gathering these celestial bodies back <coughs> to build the broken down walls and gates and gates of Jerusalem. And we read about Moses in the celestial book of Jude. Now I'm being led to think that from verse 6 in Jude and the angels that kept not their first estate all the way down to the wandering stars in verse 13 is all pertaining to these sinning angels. It all flows on from each other and it, it's all pertaining to the, to the same story. And it's entirely possible right now that verse 4 and 5 are included as well because I'm absolutely being led to think that these certain men, these certain men are the men of Belial that we read right through the Old Testament as well as the matter of Korah, the gainsaying of Kor. 
they're all these certain men as well as as well as Balaam and Cain. They're all these certain men that crept in unawares. But from verse 6 to verse 13, I'm absolutely being led to think that it's all pertaining to these sinning angels. Now, that word kor, G2879, means karah, baldness, a man with others who rebelled against Moses. And we see here Numbers 16. So the, the matter of Karah is the gainsaying of Kor. And we, of course, read about the matter of Karah, the gainsaying of Kor, in number 16 when Karah took men. Now, that word men here is an italic, so I don't know what the Hebrew word is for that. But each time we see it here in yellow, it's H582 men, and H582 men, of course, are also known as angels. So we see it five times, and we've got certain. This word certain, uh, and they rose up before Moses with certain of the children of Israel. Now, this is the matter of Karah in the gainsaying of Kor, and in verse 4, we're hearing about certain men. So that's why I'm being led to think that potentially from verse 4 all the way down to these wandering stars, celestial bodies, right? Celestial bodies who is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. That's where these wandering stars are. But that's why I'm being led to think that potentially it can come down from verse 4, which includes verse 5, you know. I, I will therefore put you in remembrance, though ye once knew this, how the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterwards destroyed them that believed not. Now, this is something I haven't really gone into yet, but right through, right through Deuteronomy, we read about Moses talking to people that should have been dead. It seems to me that the H582 men that went, that are also known as angels, that went and scoped the land in Numbers 13, 14, they perished, but the others didn't. And it just reminds me of Exodus 12 and Numbers 33 where we've got, a, we've got an absolute difference between the children of Israel and their armies. As I go on and on, there's two Israels. There's a celestial Israel and there's a terrestrial, there's a terrestrial Israel. And we may be getting a manifestation of this here because this is all celestial. All of these scriptures here are talking about, they're talking about the celestial. And in Numbers 16, 2, and they rose up, right? They rose up, these H582 men that are also known as angels, these men of Karah in the gainsaying of Kor. They rose up before Moses with certain of the children of Israel. That's also H582 men that are also known as angels. 250 princes, that's a celestial word. As I go on and on, I'm seeing princes more and more as a celestial word. Of the assembly, famous in the congregation, men of renown, right? Where where have we seen this before? Now they tempted Moses and they tempted the Lord and they tell Moses and Aaron that they take on too much. They want to do more. They want to do it better. They are rebelling against Moses. They're tempting the Lord Jesus Christ. And Moses said unto Korah, Seem it a small thing unto you that the God of Israel hath separated you from the congregation of Israel to bring you near to himself to do the service of the tabernacle of the Lord and to stand before the congregation to minister unto them. So Moses is telling them, the Lord's done all of these things and he's using you in all these ways, but yet you're still rebelling. You still can do it better minister right these ministering spirits the hebrews minister to the saints angels are ministering spirits as i go on and on it all just points back to we're looking at celestial bodies here as i say weird strange it's and i've just got to keep going i've got to keep keep going where the scriptures are leading me right it's just it all just seems so bizarre at the moment. We've got, we're just going to keep going in this house and just let the Holy Spirit and the Scriptures lead me. It was, it was always going to seem strange. Now, the fate of the men of Karah was that the earth opened her mouth and the earth swallowed them up and their houses and all the men that appertained to Karah and their goods. And they and that all that appertained to them went down alive into the pit. 
and the earth closed up on them, and they perished from among the congregation. So the men of Korah, in the gainsaying of Kor, these H582 men who are also known as angels, went down alive into the pit, and the earth closed up upon them. So that's where they went, and that's potentially where they still are, the men of Korah, in the gainsaying of Kor. And back in Jude 11, woe unto them. Unto who? All of these that we've been talking about before, and we see the word Moses, right? That's where I'm getting to. Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain, right? And ran greedily after the error of Balaam for a reward, and perished in the gainsaying of Kor. These are spots in the feast of your charity. What are? What are? These, which are these. When they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear, clouds they are without water, carried about of winds, trees whose fruit wither is without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots. They are raging waves of the sea, foaming out of their own shame, wandering stars to whom it is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. So that's where the men of Korah are in the gainsaying of Kor. They are reserved in the blackness of darkness forever. And where's that? That's the pit. That's the pit after the earth had closed up upon them. That's who the men of Korah are, these H582 men. They are wandering stars and they are in the blackness of darkness forever as they spend their days their dark, dark days in the pit after the earth closed up upon them. So we're talking about celestial H582 men that are also known as angels who have gone down into the pit after the earth closed up on them and they are in the pit, which is the blackness of darkness forever. And that's where these wandering stars are. That's where these wandering stars are. So we've got the wandering stars like, like they call Venus, Ashtaroth. And we've got Mercury, Nebo, and Molech, Saturn, Baal, <laughs> Jupiter. That's where they all are. That's where they all are. And we can see them at night time. So when we look up, we can see celestial bodies after the earth has swallowed them up. So it's fascinating stuff because the I would have thought when the earth swallows somebody up, it goes beneath. But we look up and we can see we can see these celestial bodies in the sky, in the sky where we look up. But when we come back up to verse six, and the angels, which kept not their first estate. So this word angels, the story of Joshua about the messengers that Joshua sent to, to Canaan to scope out the land that went to Rahab and Rahab saved them alive because they showed faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That, that story allows us to bring it over that it's the same principle in the New Testament. Now in Genesis 19.1, we've got the two angels, H4397 angels, they are then referred to as men in verse 5, H582 men in verse 5, and there's still H582 men in verse 10, and then in verse 15, they become H4397 angels again. So we've got angels, celestial angels, also known as H582 men. And in Joshua 2.1, Joshua sends two men, two H582 men, to spy out the land, and they went and came into a harlot's house named Rahab, H582 men. And Joshua 6.25, and Joshua saved Rahab, the harlot, alive. So we're talking about the same story. And her father's household, and all that she had, and she dwelleth in, the, in Israel, even unto this day, because she hid the messengers, H4397 messengers, which Joshua sent to spy out Jericho. Those messengers, H4397 messengers, are also known as H582 men. And in Genesis 19, 
we've got two angels, H4397, same Hebrew word as the messengers in Joshua 6, and they are also known as H582 men. H582 men, we've got for the two men that went to spy out the land, and now they're being referred to as messengers, which is the same Hebrew word as angels in Genesis 19.1. So messengers and angels is the same Hebrew word in the Old Testament, and we've got men who are also known as angels. Now, James 2.25 allows us to bring it over to the New Testament because we see the story again about Rahab. Likewise, also, was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she had received the messengers, G32, and had sent them out another way. So in the New Testament, they're referred to as messengers, G32. In the Old Testament, they're referred to as messengers, H4397. And Genesis 19, we've got two angels, H4397, who are also known as H582 men. And in Joshua 2.1, we've got the men, H582 men, who are also known as messengers, same Hebrew word as angels. And in James 2.25, they're being referred to as G32 messengers. And that Greek word for messengers, G32, is the same Greek word as we're reading here for angels in Jude 1.6. H582 men that are also known as angels. That's what we're talking about here. We're talking about G32 H4397, angels who are also known as H582 men, the sinning, wandering stars that have gone down into the pit. That's who we're talking about, the men of Korah, the angels that kept not their first estate, but who left their own habitation. They are now wandering stars in the blackness of darkness forever after the earth had swallowed them up and now they've gone down alive into the pit. And the angels which kept not their first estate but left their own habitation he hath reserved in everlasting chains unto darkness unto the judgment of the great day as they're in the pit. Now, even as Sodom and Gomorrah. So in Genesis 19, we've got angels in verse 1, H4397 angels who are also known as men in verse 5 and 10, but in verse 4, the men of Sodom are H582 men that are also known as angels. So the Sodomites are celestial bodies. They're part of these angels that kept not their first estate. And that's why these scriptures, that's why they're together, because they're talking to each other. That's who these angels are. These angels are the men, the H582 men that are also known as angels and the cities about them in like manner. And I read there just before in Ezekiel that Sodom is one of the daughters, is one of the daughters of the one mother. We've got Samaria and Jerusalem and also Sodom. They're three sisters of the one mother. And the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over, over to fornication and going after strange flesh. So what's that? What's strange flesh? What's, the, what's this strange flesh that these celestial men, these celestial angels, the men of Karah in the gainsaying of Kor, what's this strange flesh they're going after? 1 Corinthians 15, a chapter that I don't think too many pastors are reading from. These scriptures here in 1 Corinthians 15. I don't think the church houses today are talking about these scriptures. But God hath giveth it a body as it hath pleased him. And to every seed his own body. Right? So every seed has their own body. And remember in Leviticus 11, we're reading about earthen vessels. All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one kind of flesh of men, another of beasts, another of fishes, and another of birds. There are also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial, but the glory of the celestial is one, and the glory of the terrestrial is another. So, 
are these two scriptures talking to each other or are we just talking about men and animals? Birds, the fowls of the air, the beasts of the field. And remember in Jeremiah 31, 27, the Lord is going to do a new thing when he sows the house of Israel and the house of Judah with the seed of man and with the seed of beast. And that prophecy is fulfilled in Acts 10 when Simon Peter sees the vision and all manner of four-footed beasts and creeping things comes out of the heavens and the Lord Jesus Christ tells him to rise, Peter, kill and eat. And that was the moment the Gentiles were grafted in. We read that in Acts 11 verse 1 and in verse 18. Beasts. So I'm being led to think that the beasts are Gentiles. The beasts are Gentiles. So what's the difference between a man and a beast if a beast is a Gentile? What's a man? What's a beast? What's a Jew? What's a Gentile, right? Everything, everything in this house is open for discussion because as I say, as I go on and on, it just gets stranger and stranger, but I just feel as I'm just getting confirmation. So we have a look at this now. There are also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial. So is this talking about the different types of flesh? And is this going to a way to explain to us what this strange flesh might be that the H582 men that are also known as angels of Sodom and Gomorrah are going after? It, could this be that strange flesh that we're reading here in 1 Corinthians 15? Are these two scriptures talking to each other? Are the four of them talking to each other? Because in verse 38, we're reading that every seed has his own body. And in verse 40, we're reading that there's celestial bodies and there's bodies terrestrial. So every one of these celestial bodies has a seed. Every one of these terrestrial bodies have a seed. We're reading that not all flesh is the same as other flesh. Does that mean celestial bodies and terrestrial bodies have a different type of flesh? And is that what we're talking about here in Jude? Going after strange flesh. These H582 men, these celestial creatures, are these celestial creatures, these H582 men that are also known as angels that left their first estate, is this strange flesh they're going after? Is it celestial bodies going after terrestrial bodies is this the strange flesh and speaking of that word strange right solomon remember in first kings 11 solomon loved many strange women now what did those strange women cause solomon to do those strange women all his wives that his mother crowned him with in the day of his espousals bathsheba i want to get to her as well but what did these wives do? Well, they turned his heart unto other gods. And what are these other gods? Well, we've got Ashtaroth, his Venus, isn't she? We've got Molech, his Saturn. And we've got Solomon's vineyard at Balhaman. That was Jupiter. That was Jupiter. So these, these strange women, these strange women made Solomon go after and worship celestial celestial bodies right and we've got different types of bodies for celestial and terrestrial bodies do they have a different type of flesh and every one of these bodies has been given his own seed and we've got angels h582 men celestial bodies celestial bodies they're leaving their own estate and going after strange flesh. And we've got Solomon. Well, he's going after strange women. And those strange women are causing him to go after celestial bodies. So what's the relationship between these strange women and these celestial bodies? And what's the power? What's this power that these strange women have got over Solomon? These women have got, like, they've, they've made Solomon go from 100% from the Lord. And now Solomon's gone fully after Lucifer. 
they've got some pretty significant power over Solomon to these strange women. There's got to be something about them that they've made him go. They've made him go from 100% to the Lord to whore after these 700 wives that make him go and worship celestial bodies. And we know that we've got angels who went after who went after strange flesh. So, a, so an angel is a celestial body, is it not? All flesh is not the same flesh. There's one kind of flesh of men, of beasts, of beasts, of fishes and of birds. And in Jude 1.10, well, these angels are being referred to as brute beasts, aren't they? Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fauna and going after strange flesh are set forth for an example suffering the vengeance of eternal fire likewise also these filthy dreamers defile the flesh despise dominion and speak evil of dignity yet Michael the archangel when contending with the devil he disputed about the body of Moses durst not bring against him a rallying accusation, but said, the Lord rebuked thee. And then we come down to the scriptures that I've shared, that these, that these things which they know not, but they know naturally as brute beasts, in those things they corrupt. They corrupt themselves, right? That's what the children of Israel did. And then we woe unto them. Woe unto them because they've gone after, they've gone the same way of Cain and ran greedily after the Arab alarm and perished. They've actually perished in the gainsaying of, of core, these natural brute beasts. And we've got, we've got the devil. We've got the devil contending with Michael the archangel about the body of Moses. So it just seems if this if, if if this isn't pertaining to some sort of celestial story, it's very random. It's very random that the body of Moses would be would be argued about in the celestial. Why would they be arguing about Moses's body in the celestial? And in Deuteronomy thirty four, we read about the death of Moses. And Moses went up from the plains of Moab unto the mountain of Nebo. So this is Mercury. This is Mercury. To the top of Pisgah, that is over against Jericho, and the Lord showed him all the land of Gilead unto Dan, and all Nephtali, and all the land of Ephraim and Manasseh, and all the land of Judah to the utmost sea, and, and the south, and the plain of the valley of Jericho to the city of palm trees unto Zoar. That's where Lot went for memory. And the Lord said unto him, This is the land which I swear unto Abraham, and unto Isaac, and unto Jacob, saying, I will give it unto thy, unto thy seed. Right? <laughs> then, then we've got, so we've got every, everybody has its own seed. There's one glory of the terrestrial and the, and the celestial. I have caused thee to see it with thine own eyes, but thou shalt not go over thither, because he he tempted the laws in the in the waters of strife at Kadesh. Now remember that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were strangers and pilgrims on the earth, and that word pilgrim, the Greek word for pilgrim, means that they were a visitor from heaven. So they were a celestial body sojourning on the earth and this is the land that i swear unto those three celestial bodies that were dwelling on the earth and in genesis 26 it reads to me it reads to me that isaac's seed is going to multiply as the stars of heaven because it is the stars of heaven that's how it's going to manifest his seed is going to manifest as the stars of heaven, saying, I will give it unto thy seed. I have caused thee to see it with thine own eyes, but they shall not go over thither. So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab, according to the word of the Lord. And they buried him in a valley in the land of Moab, 
over against Beth Pua. But no man knoweth of his sepulchre unto this day. So Moses went up from the plains of Moab unto the mountain of Nebo. And Nebo means prophet. And the outline of biblical usage is giving us Latin Mercury. And it's also giving us Mercury. The planet Mercury. So that's where he's gone. Moses has gone up from the plains of Moab up to the mountain of Nebo to do these things. But it says in verse 5 that he died there in the land of Moab. It doesn't actually say if he died in Nebo, in Mercury or not. But it does say that he, he died there in the land of Moab. And Nebo, it gives us a city in Moab. But, 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 it also gives us the mountain where Moses died. And we're also seeing that it's Latin Mercury. And the Chaldee lexicon just tells us directly that Nebo is the planet Mercury. So Moses went up from the plains of Moab unto the mountain of Nebo, and this is Mercury, and the and Moses, the servant of the Lord, died, and Blue Letter Bible is giving us Mercury. Nebo is Mercury. So the scriptures are telling us that Moses certainly died in the land of Moab, but Blue Letter Bible... Well, Blue Letter Bible's telling us that he died in Mercury. And they buried him in a valley in the land of Moab over against Beth Pua. Now, check out this word, Beth Pua. Hebrew word 1047. It means house of Pua, a place east of Jordan in the land of the Amorites, allocated to the tribe, to the tribe of Reuben. But it also gives us H6465. And that means Pua. So it's the same thing because we've got Beth Pua is the house of Pua and we've got Pua, it means cleft, a mountain peak in Moab belonging to the Abram range and near Pisgah. A false god worshipped in Moab corresponds to Baal, right? Corresponds to Baal. So we're back to Baal and Baal means Lord and that's Jupiter. And this comes back to Solomon's Vineyard because Solomon's Vineyard was Baal Haman and it pertained to Baal and Jupiter. And it also comes back to Bel, Bel being the deity that they'd been worshipping since the Tower of Babel that also pertains that also pertains to Jupiter. So this is where Moses was buried. An idol of the Moabites in whose worship women prostituted themselves. So here we go with these women again. Here we go with these women playing up again. And this is where Balak, Balak took Balaam there, right? It's this, this, this pure, this is where he stood at the top of the mountain. But this is where, this is where Moses was buried. So we've got Moses going up to Mercury and then he died. He died in Moab. And Mercury's in Moab, but they buried him in this place called Beth Pua. And Beth Pua means house of Pua. And Pua means cleft. And it's a false god worshipped in Moab corresponds to Baal. An idol of the Moabites in whose women worship women prostituted themselves. Well, this is where Moses was buried. Moses was buried there at Baal. And no man knows of his sepulchre unto this day. And in the celestial book of Jude, with all these scriptures that I've just been sharing, how I'm absolutely being led to think that all of these is about celestial angels, celestial bodies, wandering stars, the matter of Korah, the gainsaying of Kor, where the earth swallowed them up, and and now their, their, their habitation is the blackness of darkness forever in the nether parts of the earth. These trees who fruit wither us and the similarities to that to, to the Pharisees and, and Mark eleven and Revelation six and the and the fig tree casting off her untimely figs and that's been likened back to stars being cast down to the earth. We've got these angels that left their first estate. They went after strange flesh. Solomon went after strange women. And now we've got Michael the Archangel. He's contending with the devil 
about the body of Moses. And we read that Moses, just before he dies, goes up to Nebo, which is Mercury, and he dies. He dies. The scriptures tell us that he dies in the land of Moab. And Blue Letter Bible is telling us that he died in Nebo, which is Mercury. But after he dies in Mercury, they bury him in this Beth Pua. And Beth Pua means house of Pua. And Pua is a false god worshipped in Moab corresponds to Baal and Baal seemingly is Jupiter. So when we return to this Hebrew word H5015 well it starts to seem a little bit logical that we're talking about a celestial body and we see it again in the first Chronicles lineages chapters and Bela the son of Azaz the son of Shema. Now this is the lineage of Reuben and First Chronicles 5, 1 becomes very interesting. Now, the sons of Reuben, so we see it here in verse 8. We're talking about the lineage of the, of the tribe of Reuben. Now, the sons of Reuben, the firstborn of Israel, for he was the firstborn for so much as he defiled his father's bed. His birthright was not given unto sons of Joseph, the son of Israel. And the genealogy is not to be reckoned after the birthright. And in verse 8, We've got Nebo happening again. Now, Nebo again is Mercury, but we've got Baal again, haven't we? We've got Baal again. So this Baal man, it means Lord of the habitation. So we've got Baal again, Lord. Baal, Lord. So I'm absolutely being led to think that we've got, we've got Jupiter going on again here. So we've got Nebo and Jupiter in the lineage of Reuben. And let us not forget that Beth Peor, I think I was saying this wrong, apologies. Beth Peor, the, I'm probably still saying it wrong. The, in, in Beth Peor, the house of Peor, it was allocated, it was allocated to Reuben. And Peor means cleft, and it's a false god worshipped in Moab, which corresponds to Baal, which again, which again is Jupiter. And this Beth Peor, which went to the tribe of Reuben. This is the place where they buried Moses after he died, after he died in Mercury. But we've got in the lineage of Reuben, the firstborn who defiled his father's bed, we've got Mercury and we've got Jupiter. It's just all pointing towards all of these places of celestial bodies. And then we come in to these scriptures I've been talking about, the two celestial books, Ezra and Nehemiah, where it's talking about the H582 men, Bethel being one of those places, and Bethel is where Jacob's ladder was, and there's a highway going going up from Bethel to, to Shechem. We read that in Judges, the celestial star course. It's all, it's all pointing. All of this is pointing to celestial bodies. That's what the scriptures are saying, and that's what all of the study tools are also saying. It is actually a second Hebrew word for the word Nebo, H5562. It's Sam Gar Nemo. Now, I've been saying that this gets strange and it just seems to be getting stranger and stranger. The further I go here, I'm seeing a couple of things that this video I don't think is ever going to end for one, which is terrific because the amount I'm learning where... We're well over seven hours now, and it's just going to, the further I go here, the the stranger and weirder things seem to be. It just, I never thought the truth would be this, and I'm starting to see how they, they've been telling us the truth about certain things in plain sight while lying about it. It's all, as I say, it's all very, very strange. It seems strange. It's not strange. It's because it's the truth. It's because we're under the spell. But it seems strange, man. This seems really, really strange. But on we go. Nebo means prophet. And Nebo is connected with Latin mer Mercury. And this is the place where Moses went and... Blue Letter Bible's telling us that that's where that's where he died. The scriptures doesn't say it. The scriptures say he was he died somewhere in 
in Moab and they buried him. They buried him in Beth Peor. The scriptures tell us that, but we know he went to Mercury and that's where the Lord spoke to him and the and the Blue Letter Bible's telling us that that's, that's where he died, in Mercury. But we've got this Nebo. Nebo is Mercury. Now, the second Hebrew word that we have for Nebo is Semgra Nebo, Sword of Nebo. Now, he's one of the princes or generals of King Nebuchadnezzar of, of Babylon, Babylon. So this is the Sword of Nebo, and Nebo's Mercury, right? This, what I'm about to share, is giving me some pretty significant confirmations that princes are, in fact, celestial bodies. So we've got Sangra Nebo is the sword of Nebo, and we've got Nebo means prophet, Latin Mercury, and the Chaldee lexicon is telling us that Nebo is the planet Mercury. Now, the Chaldee lexicon, it gives a sword of Nebo of Mercury, a sword of a Babylonian commander. So this is the sword of Mercury. It's saying it in the Chaldee lexicon and it's consistent with what we're getting for Nebo. Nebo's Mercury. And we've got Sangra Nebo is the sword of Mercury and the Chaldee lexicon says that. Says that, the sword of, of Mercury. And we see him in, in one scripture and you can see all of these other names that we've got highlighted here. So this is talking about where Nebuchadnezzar and his army came and besieged Jerusalem. He did this with all of these characters. One of those characters, the sword of Mercury, right? So the sword of Mercury is being used of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, to besiege Jerusalem. So let's have a look at a couple of these characters that we've got in Jeremiah 39. So we've got Nagul Shariza is a prince, right? So we've got a prince again, a prince of fire, a chief soothsayer, and a ruler in the army of Nebuchadnezzar and the Chaldee Lexicon. What's it give us? A prince of Mars. So we've got another celestial body. So this prince, this is what I mean, these princes are celestial bodies. With this prince, a prince of fire is a prince of Mars. The prince whom Mars favors. I wish we'd all been ready. Children died, the days grew cold. A piece of bread could buy a bag of gold. I wish we'd all been ready. There's no time to change your mind. The sun has come.